prolonged exposure of organ systems to excessive free cortisol. Now, now why is this a worry? Well, untreated Cushing syndrome leads to a five time increase in standardized mortality. So Cushing syndrome was first discovered by the gentleman on the right, Harvey Cushing, who described the condition as pluriglandular syndrome. The incidence of Cushing's is reported as being one in a quarter of a million with no geographical variation. The causes of Cushing's syndrome are split into endogenous cortisol overproduction and exogenous cortisol uh, administration. With endogenous cortisol overproduction, the majority of causes involve excess ACTH, which stimulates the adrenals to produce cortisol. Now, why is ACTH produced in excess? Well, there are two causes. The most common cause, 80% of the time, is excess ACTH production due to a pit pituitary adenoma and this results in Cushing's disease. Therefore Cushing's syndrome is due to free cortisol excess but if this cortisol excess is found to be caused by ACTH and subsequently by a pituitary adenoma it is called Cushing's disease and 20% of the time ACTH is produced in excess due to ectopic production from various cancers including small cell lung cancer, bronchial cancer, pheocytochroma and carcinoma tumors. Now although not common, excess cortisol can be produced with a normal level of ACTH in the blood. We call these ACTH independent causes of Cushing's syndrome and they include carcinoma of the adrenals. Exogenous cortisol excess is um, iatrogenic and can be through different modes such as oral inhaled or even topical medications. Uh, such as uh, clobetasol, which is used in psoriasis. So let's talk a bit about cortisol itself. It comes from the zona fasciculata in the cortex of the adrenal glands. It is commonly referred to as the stress hormone, being released more in response to physiological, emotional and traumatic stress. The levels of cortisol in the body are regulated by the ACTH molecule from the anterior pituitary, which itself is regulated by CRH produced from the hypothalamus. Since CRH is released in a cyclic fashion, plasma cortisol levels peak during the morning roughly around 6 to 8 am and in the evening at 11 pm. Once ACTH is released, it acts on the adrenal cortex resulting in the production and release of cortisol. Most of the cortisol produced binds to cortisol binding globulin and albumin. 5% however roams free and this is the unbound cortisol which is physiologically active. Cortisol like many hormones boasts a multifaceted role in the body including reduction in inflammation, sustaining blood pressure, suppressing the immune system and increasing blood sugar through the process of gluconeogenesis. Therefore having too much of cortisol will impact and derange these functions. So with the next few slides we will look at how an excess of free cortisol in the body results in signs and symptom manifestations in Cushing's syndrome linking what occurs at the micro level to the macro level. We mentioned that cortisol plays a role in increasing blood sugar through gluconeogenesis. In Cushing's syndrome this results in weight gain diabetes mellitus and impaired glucose tolerance. With impaired glucose tolerance, especially in mild Cushing syndrome, this leads to a considering, considerable overlap in the presentation with that of metabolic syndrome, which is an important uh, differential. Typically, weight gain in Cushing syndrome tends to occur around the waist. The reason being that an excess of glucocorticoids causes an increase in expression of hormone-sensitive lipase which is expressed more so on peripheral adipocytes. This results in decreased deposition and accumulation of fat in the peripheries and more so centrally. A well-known sign of Cushing's syndrome is, uh, or cortisol excess is um, striae. However, this is a very late sign a, and may well be absent. So why do these striae form more well, cortisol excess inhibits keratinocyte proliferation in the epidermis as well as inhibiting collagen types 1 and free production in the dermis. Additionally, fibroblasts as well as hyaluronic acid producing enzymes are inhibited leading to dermal atrophy. 
Now, this same mechanism is uh, the cause of bruising and thinning of skin, which is seen commonly in um, patients in long-term steroid um, use. Additionally, another reason for the considerable overlap between Cushing syndrome and metabolic syndrome is the presence of hypertension. Now, cortisol enhances the vasopressor effect of adrenaline and noradrenaline, resulting in constriction of blood vessels. When and when this is in excess, this contributes to an ele elevation in blood pressure. Now, the opposite is seen in Addison's disease, where there is a deficiency in cortisol. Patients typically experience dizziness with orthostasis, though the symptom is also contrib contributed to by a lost one deficiency, uh, causing volume depre depletion via sodium ex excretion and potassium retention, as sodium is essential in maintaining extracellular volume. A surplus of ACTH can also result in hyperpigmentation, as shown on the right. This occurs primarily due to the nature of the AC. TH molecule and where it comes from. The molecule which it comes from is POMC. The slide shows the POMC molecule and its derivatives. If we focus our attention, uh, attention on the ACTH derivative box in bed, it shows that the ACTH molecule consists of a alpha MSH and a clip. Consequently, if there is an increase in ACTH for whatever reason, then there is an increase in MSH. MSH then goes on to uh, stimulate melanin production, resulting in hyperpigmentation. So if we take a closer look at the other derivatives of POM POMC, we can see that there is gamma and beta MSH on the left and right hand sides. Um, however, alpha MSH is the most important melanocortin in hyperpigmentation. The ability of cortisol additionally to um, react with androgen receptors at high enough concentrations also result also results in hirsutism and hypertrichosis. Menstrual irregularities also occur due to um, cortisol suppressing GnRH. Peripheral muscle wasting is also a feature of excess cortisol. This occurs due to insulin resistance caused by cortisol, which promotes lactate metabolism. This effectively catabolizes muscle. As a result, many patients find it difficult to move from sitting to standing position. This sign is far less common in pseudo cushions discussed further on, so its presence helps to outweigh this differential. The patient on the right has marked bicep atrophy and made more prominent by comparison with his pectoral muscles, which are of normal bulk. So how does the how does cortisol affect the kidney? Cortisol binds equally to both mineralocorticoid um, receptors, which are intended for aldosterone, and glucocorticoid receptors, um, which are the default. We can appreciate that by cortisol binding to um, mineralocorticoid receptors, it can act in the same way that aldosterone does. So, uh, in our body, we have an enzyme, 11 beta HSD, which inactivates cortisol by converting it to cortisone. However, again, at high enough concentrations, the enzyme becomes overwhelmed and cortisol acts on these mineralocorticoid receptors. This results in aldosterone effects of retaining sodium um, and causing increasing potassium excretion, edema, hypertension, hyperkalemia and hypernatremia. So depression is also a very, um, quite a common finding in Cushing syndrome. The pathophysiology is not known. However, patients improve greatly post-cure. It is always a good idea, therefore, to screen for depression. And this can be done very easily using the PHQ-2 questionnaire, which asks to scale how often, if at all, uh, patients feel little interest in doing things, feeling down and or uh, hopeless. If a score of three or more it comes up, then a major depressive disorder is likely. Uh, this questionnaire, if required, can be followed up with a PHQ-9. So um, now we consider the, dif the differentials of Cushing syndrome. So depression, as mentioned, may present with weight gain, mood changes in a similar way to Cushing syndrome. Polycystic ovarian sy syndrome is an important differential. Women often present with menstrual problems, increased body and facial hair, weight gain, 
half of PCOS patients are clinically obese um, with, and they also have symptoms of diabetes mellitus. Obesity, physical um, stress, um, obesity hypothyroidism, sorry. Um, so this may occur with cortisol excess in the instance of an anterior pituitary uh, mass hindering the release of TRH. Mild Cushing, as mentioned before, has considerable overlap with the metabolic syndrome. So I'm just going to do a quick mention of what pseudo Cushing's act actually is. So it's an umbrella term describing conditions with features of Cushing's syndrome, but the elevated cortisol due to factors other than uh, problems with the HPA axis. Such conditions result in excess cortisol production, um, which includes um, depression, PCOS, obesity, physical stress, malnutrition, eating disorders, uncontrolled diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, and chronic alcohol alcoholism which presents with the cushing node impairments so these conditions cause an elevation in cortisol like cushings someone with cushings um, will have obvious um, signs though it is still important to conduct a further history to better the initial diagnosis and uh, also mild cushings may not have observable manifestations so the presenting complaint uh, patients may initially present with the following uh, weight gain, menstrual problems, libido loss, bruising, depression, hypertension, weakness, fatigue. With each of these presenting complaints, elaborate as much as possible. For example, if a patient presents with weight gain, ask how much, over what period of time, ask if it was intentional, if there was any changes in diet, and you can ask about how they, if their clothes have become tighter, has someone closer close to them noticed that they've gained size are they on any medications etc so once you do elaborate the um, presenting complaint we then move on to the history of presenting complaint where you we are looking to narrow down differentials with Cushing's disease as uh, Cushing syndrome as a differential ask about specific weight gain um, around the abdomen and skin changes such as bruising remember that uh, striae is a very late sign so it's not always present especially in mild or early Cushing syndrome Another differential is hypothyroidism. So you can start by asking the patient if they have been constipated, despite normal diet, adequate fruit intake, ask about feeling colder than normal, for example, as well as any skin or hair changes. So the responses to these questions are of little value diagnostically, but it's a good starting point. It helps point us in some direction. PCOS is another important differential, and the questions to ask include about period regular, if their periods are regular, increased hair, body hair, um, and uh, also, if a patient does experience any vis vision changes, um, this may be due to macro uh, adenoma um, having um, put pressure on the uh, optic chiasm. So, now we move on to past medical history. So, we can ask about recent health, medical conditions, medications. Specifically, we are looking for prescribed over the counter medications, any steroids. Um, so, we will check compliance with medications to access correct dosing an important point to remember here is that herbal remedies um, always ask about herbal remedies oriental medicine for example may contain steroids and the user could be taking these without their knowledge ask about allergies previous hospitalizations surgeries and family history important for example if the patient has had family members with uh, for example thyroid issues personal activities such as smoking alcohol important as chronic users may have a cushion uh, cushing goid uh, appearance diet and physical activity social history includes job and accommodation so now we move on to the examination so we start off with the vitals pulse and blood pressure blood pressure may be elevated for the reasons discussed oxygen saturations after this is done then we follow up with a general examination looking for the classic signs of cushing's and after this general examination, we then conduct specific examinations such as cardiovascular, thyroid, respiratory, abdominal and musculoskeletal exams to look for peripheral muscle weakness. Investigations include blood, full blood count, use and ease, thyroid function tests, blood sugar, testosterone for PCOS and cortisol, which we will be expanding on very shortly. So imaging is generally not required in these early stages. 
So, so we can test for cortisol in essentially three different ways. Um, the low dose dexamethasone suppression test, late night salivary or midnight serum cortisol, and 24 hour urinary free cortisol. We need at least two of these tests to be abnormal to establish a diagnosis of Cushing syndrome. So let's talk a bit about the dexamethasone test. Dexamethasone is essentially a potent glucocorticoid acting in the body as a super cortisol, so to speak. Ordinarily, um, the presence of dexamethasone would induce negative feedback and halt ACTH production in the body and therefore suppress cortisol production. If cortisol is still elevated and not suppressed, then the test is abnormal. The actual test can be carried out in two different ways, with the 1 mg overnight test or the 48-hour test. In normal individuals, serum cortisol is below 50 nanomoles per litre in both tests. So that's what we are looking for. Like the majority of tests, false positives may arise due to medications which increase the hepatic clearance of dexamethasone, and these include carbamazepine, uh, phenytoin, phenobarbital, and rifampicin. An important point to note is that about 5 patients with Cushing's uh, syndrome show cortisol suppression below 50 nanometers, uh, 50 in, um, nmol, so this highlights the need for other tests to make a confirmatory diagnosis. So the normal circadian rhythm for cortisol, as discussed before, is lost in Cushing's syndrome and the late night salivary cortisol is a useful test to detect this it does not require admission unlike the midnight midnight serum cortisol test so is generally preferred as with low dexamethasone suppression test a value of uh, 50 nanomoles per liter points away from cushing syndrome and the last test used is 24 hour free cortisol test quite straightforward which requires uh, free collections so once we have confirmed that the patient suffers from Cushing syndrome, we must identify the cause of this glucocorticoid excess. This is done via the measurement of plasma ACTH. A plasma ACTH level below 5 picograms per milliliter indicates an ACTH independent cause of Cushing syndrome because, un, um, because the unchanging ACT, ACTH means that the HPA axis is not involved. Therefore, a primary adrenal cause of cortisol excess is to blame, such as a carcinoma of the adrenals. Imaging is recommended following this. A plasma ACTH um, whereas above 15 picograms per milliliter allude to a ACTH dependent cause of, such as um, um, ACTH directly causing the cortical excess. It is um, really important to interpret these values with caution and repeat in order to avoid errors. So these MRI scans show a pituitary adenoma causing dysfunction in the HPA axis resulting in ACTH dependent Cushing's syndrome. Since we know that the pituitary adenoma is the cause of this of the excess in cortisol, we in this instance we can call this Cushing's disease. Differentiating between neuroendocrine tumors and pituitary tumors require both biochemical evaluation as well as imaging, as 40% of corticotroph microadenomas are not visualized with MRI, and incel incidentalomas, as they're called, are found in about 10% of the healthy population. So it's quite important to have both biochemical evidence and imaging. Besides this, we know that ectopic ACTH production from a neuroendocrine tumor uh, produces greater amounts of cortisol than pituitary adenomas. As mentioned before, this causes cortisol to act on mineralocorticoid receptors intended for aldosterone, resulting the result of significance being hyperkalemia. This can be another way to narrow down the possible causes, but it is, has been shown to be a feature. So treatment. How do we treat? The mainstay is surgery, 
So we have options of transphenoidal surgery, which offers long-lasting remission in about 50 to 60% of cases. In patients who have adrenal adenomas or carcinomas, these can be operated on, but prognosis is poor for the latter. A key point, with ACTH-dependent Cushing's, removal of both adrenal glands may be necessary. If this does happen, in rare instances, the pituitary adenoma may continue to grow and release ACTH very aggressively, resulting in visual loss, secondary to the growth of the tumour, and pituitary failure, as well as dark skin pigmentation. This condition is called Nelson syndrome. If the cause for Cushing syndrome is ACTH-dependent neuroendocrine tumours, then removal of these tumours results in remission. Medical treatment uh, is mainly used to prepare patients for surgery or if surgery is unsuccessful. Examples include uh, metyropon. Pituitary radiotherapy can also be used following from transphenoidal surgery if symptoms persist. The key side effect is progressive pituitary failure. Also, growth hormone is deficient in all patients after 10 years. So that wraps up the lecture. Thank you again for watching. If you do have any questions, queries, please leave them in the comment section below. Thanks again.